and just say welcome everybody to CDNY Country Dance Lore. Um, this is a, a program uh, talking about the many, the many pieces of English country dance surrounding the actual dancing, the people, the history, the, the funny stories. Um, in this case, we have Paul Ross will be speaking to us about uh, the legendary choreographer and uh, dance reconstructor and dancer Frieda Metz Herman. Um, that is uh, Paul's topic for tonight. Paul is a longtime English country dancer. He began in Chicago in 1971 um, and then moved to New York, began uh, apprenticing as a caller in 1993, and uh, really took on the the perspective and outlook, uh, the vision of English country dancing uh, that Frieda Metz Herman uh, was familiar with and uh, has really promoted her dances and her legacy and uh, knew very much about her, collected a lot of information and he's got a lot of wonderful photos and stories here to share with us tonight. So before I lead into Paul, I'll just go through our housekeeping. Um, so tonight's ta talk uh, is Enter the Dragon Lady, Freak to Metz Herman. So to what extent we have a dragon uh, remains to be seen. Um, tonight's program format, we're starting with our announcements right now. And at 7.40, uh, Paul will, will begin speaking. And he's got a solid half hour of reminiscences and videos and photos. Um, at at 8.10, we will begin uh, reading off your Q&A. So, uh, and then after the Q&A, they'll be socializing. Regarding how to ask questions, um, please uh, do it via the chat box. We ask you to remain muted during the presentation and in Zoom, here's where you will uh, hit the mute button. If you would like to be off uh, camera, that's where you do it too. So here's the chat box. To put in a question, please, Click on the chat box and key into there. Um, the session's being recorded. If you'd rather not be recorded or streamed video, then uh, turn off your video and I'll show you where that is. Um, it also helps to turn off your video if you're having trouble with your bandwidth and the, the feed is stuttering. Um, this recording is going to be posted on Facebook and on YouTube and we have direct links at cdny.org. Um, that page was under construction on YouTube until recently, and now it's live as the, all these uh, recordings are collected. Uh, and here's where you turn off video. Just uh, click on stop video and it'll show a little red flash over it. So um, I, we do want to hear your feedback, um, what's working, uh, what you like, what you think uh, might be improved that we can actually do during a pandemic. Um, and if desired, you can make a donation to CDNY at cdny.org forward slash give. Uh, I'd like to thank tonight's team. Um, Jeff Berry is hosting on Facebook and he is reviewing those questions. Uh, Danny Walkowitz is running the door and he is uh, watching the chat box for your questions there. And I, Dorothy Cummings, am hosting on Zoom. So our speaker tonight is Paul Ross. Uh, as I mentioned, he began dancing in uh, the 70s. He began apprenticing as a caller in the 90s. And he really, uh, he got to know Frit de Metz Herman very well and really embraced her vision of what English country dance uh, should look like, should be, um, and got to know her very well as a person. Um, and many of us knew her in person and uh, experienced her teaching it at various stages of her career. For myself, I began dancing in the late 90s. I, I, I knew an elderly Freet who was beginning to have trouble moving, but that's not the only Freet that there is, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Um, we have a little bit of music out of Brian's Bhutan, one of the dances that Freet wrote, uh, and after that, I will invite Paul to begin. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now, Paul. Thank you, Dorothy. After a musical introduction like that, I think we should turn this into a Zoom dance. But, <laughs> but it's actually about Frit and um, uh, what I call the softer, kinder, gentler side of Frit. Um, what, what are the most common images of Frit Herman among those who did not know her as a friend? Certainly, brilliant choreographer, teacher with high, even impossibly high standards, thoughtful writer with several important essays on English country dancing to her credit, close friend of the legendary Pat Shaw, and so on. For all this, there is a persistent view of Freit, among many, that she was not just a demanding teacher, she was also impatient, excessively demanding, the dragon lady. Like all such impressions, there's truth in this view. And as you see uh, in the slide uh, that preceded the one that's now on the screen, Free reveled in her reputation to some degree. What I hope to do tonight, uh, however, is rebalance the ledger and show the softer side of Frit de Metz Herman, humanizing her for those many dancers who know only the legend and not the lady. So let us embark on a journey through her life, beginning with Frit as a young girl and moving through what evidence we have of her as a lover of animals, a friend to many, and a masterful raconteur with a terrific sense of humor. Now let's wind back the clock and spend a little time visiting Freet as a young girl. Freet was born on November 13th, 1926 in Amsterdam to a Jewish father and a Christian mother. Her only sibling, her sister Noor, was a year older than she the family lived in an Art Deco housing complex built in 1924 along what then was the outer perimeter of the city. On the website architecturehistory.org, an article by contributor Helen Searing states that the Amsterdam School, comprising Dutch uh, architects active between 1910 and 1930, transformed entire portions of the city and influenced architecture throughout the Netherlands. Although almost every building type was addressed, the major monuments are government-funded ensembles of workers' dwellings arranged in perimeter blocks that brought a new scale to Dutch cities. And apparently, Friet's family lived in one of those blocks. In her own words, And you may play the... I'll tell you where we lived. There was no theater, no cars, no traffic. You see, it was a little square on which we lived. It was like this, triangular, mm -hmm. and a straight one. And the people on the straight one, we didn't talk to. But here, we all played together now. We all happen to be the same age. And not only did we play together when we were small, Many went teachers, became teachers, and went to the same college. Fritz College was in the central city. Uh, I don't know its name. Her father, Hartog de Metz, was musical, self-taught on the tin whistle. He was a photographer, very resourceful, and good with his hands. Uh, Hartog had a small boat, which the family used for vacations. Fried obviously loved the outdoors, and she was very fond of animals. Not surprisingly, Fried's love of animals expressed itself in her dances, or at least in the titles she chose for them. So, for instance, her first dance, as most of us know, was the wood duck, and many more followed that classic composition. Some had obvious names, birds of a feather, 
cat in the window, porcupine house, and that great show dance the Mavis sweetly sings. Others were less obvious. The night visitors, for instance, refers to the raccoons that uh, came out at night near her house in Larchmont and which she fed with scraps from her kitchen and tracks in the snow which definitely referred to the, car to the raccoons. And beyond the animal world, Freet reveled in the wider world of nature itself. She wrote February Flower, Black-Eyed Susan, The Ponderosa Pine, Golden Alexanders, and Phacelia. She commemorated fireflies, a comet, Hale Bop Circle, and a hurricane, Opal Circle. And then there is one of Faina's favorite dances, The Eye of the Storm. Does anybody remember the TV show, Marty Stauffer's Wild America? So here is a cool little three couple set dance that she wrote to honor Stauffer's commitment to wildlife and conservation. In the same volume, The Naked Truth from 1986, she also wrote Greenpeace Reel, in her words, to honor the international group of dedicated people working for a green and peaceful world. Living in such a world was certainly Freet's aspiration too. She wanted that for all people and especially for her friends. When we think of Freet's friends and her devotion to, it, to them, foremost in our minds really should be her husband, Al. They danced together, played music together, supported each other, and let's face it, adored each other. By the way, this is uh, Al and Freet um, at the 1965 World's Fair um, in New York. The honesty, forbearance, and devotion in their relationship was rock solid, and there could have been no better foundation for their marriage than their enduring friendship. Now, in Freet's own words. In 1965, uh, I married Al Herman, and he loved dancing as much as I do. I could not have married anybody else, because um, if I wanted to go to a dance, he wanted to. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted to go to a dance, I wanted to. We went together everywhere. That is why I'm not talking about street dancing, it's Ellen Freed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always together. We were together and it was really lovely. Mm -hmm. Coming home late at night, you're tired, and together in the car is kind of cozy. It really was. Yeah, yeah. of course. And we went everywhere. And now Al learned to learn music. He learned to play the recorder. He had never learned to, to read music or play but he said he would dance better if he could play the tune. I think that was very clever of Al to do that. And he always kept playing till right before he died. I would be downstairs doing this, that, and upstairs I hear peep, peep, peep. He's doing a tune, and I shout upstairs, it's an F sharp there. <laughs> That excerpt, by the way, uh, comes from an interview I did with Freet in late 2006, early 2007, called Tea with Freet. And I'd like you to hear one additional, very short excerpt where Freet explains what her marriage with Al did for her. America has done a lot of good to me. This may be a human being. And Al has been. He did, I didn't realize it at that time. Looking back, I think that Al gave me self-confidence. And how did he do that? By thinking that I was marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love that little clip. Well, of course, for many, um, it is Pat Shaw who comes to mind as a friend of Freed's. 
Their friendship lasted over a decade and a half, ending only with Pat's untimely death in 1977. As you probably know, both Freet and Pat expressed their friendships uh, with others through the dance. So not surprisingly, Pat wrote The American Husband or Her Man <laughs> as a gift to Freet and, and Al. Uh, Freet dedicated her fourth book, Choice Morsels to Pat, and wrote a dance, Patrick Noel, in his honor. She also spoke of him with admiration and keen affection, as we'll hear in this excerpt from another audio I did with her in 2007. Pat was a, an absolutely wonderful friend. Uh, apart from what he could do, he could compose, he could sing, he, he could conduct a choir, uh, he could uh, uh, everything, but he was such a good friend. And that is really wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Now, if you want to hear an account of my own friendship with Freet, I invite you to listen to my tribute to her at CDW's memorial service held for Freed on April 11th, 2010. It's on the Country Dancers of Westchester's website under the tab Freed de Metz Herman's Legacy, and I think a link uh, to it will be posted in the chat. And the story I tell is just as scary and funny as that, that photo of me and Freed taken at the Halloween party. So now I realize that this photo here uh, may um, ruffle some feathers or hurt some feelings, and I, and I do apologize. I have inevitably left out uh, many of you, um, but obviously I couldn't include all of Freed's friends in this collage. So if you belong in this gallery, uh, please consider the Your Photo Here square as yours. Fried had uh, many friends, both here and abroad, some close, some casual, some based on family, language, and her connection to Holland, many based on music, some on proximity and familiarity, and the shared pleasures of gossip, and she was very good at that. <laughs> Almost all were based on one or another aspect of English country dancing. And whatever the relationship folks had with her, when they were enjoyed off the dance floor, one-on-one, -on -one, at a meal or at a break, or traveling together somewhere, Freet proved immensely entertaining, a dry wit, an inquiring mind, unconventional opinions, and a great talent for storytelling. So in this final section on the dragon lady, who I hope now appears as less of the fire breathing type than some have considered her, I'm mostly going to let Freet speak for herself. The first clip uh, we're going to see uh, was taken actually on a kind of toy video camera, so, so please don't concentrate on its poor quality, but rather focus on Freet's words. She tells the backstory behind the title of the dance that she wrote for Andrew Shaw called The English Poacher. The dancers at the 2002 Freet for All had a lot of fun with this, as you'll now hear. The first dance, the English poetry. Um, the tune is a soldier and sailor, because I didn't like the dance. It's an old dance for 1718, but I didn't like the dance. But then I find other people did like the dance, or didn't, that published it anyway, if they liked it or not. Anyway, I used the tune. And um, the English poetry, that 
is Andrew Shaw, did, you know Andrew Shaw kind of. He did a, a workshop in England called Poached from Free. From free. <laughs> so he is the English poacher. In it is a figure called The Rounding, and it is a flirtatious movement I write in it. And he wrote back to me, it fits me to a T. <laughs> So I'm going to give you another example of Frit, the raconteur. Somewhere in 1960, somewhere around there, but I haven't been able to firmly identify the actual year, but in the early 60s, I believe, Frit quit her teaching job and went to London to dance with Pat Shaw. And on Pat's recommendation, she was offered a job as a housekeeper at a boarding house in Hampstead called Abernethy House. In the interview she did with me called Tea with Freet, she relates several delightful escapades from that time. And I've excerpted just this one gem. But where, where was the house exactly? Was it... Um... Hampstead. Hampstead, uh, the subway, the underground is down. And then the, the road goes straight up a very high hill towards Hampstead Heath which is a wild area, it's beautiful. There's still foxes there. I, I didn't see them, but I smelled where they, where they live. You can smell a fox. And then uh, he lived uh, in the house that was on the corner of Ragnall, on the top of the hill, actually, which was very difficult because it was a very severe winter and uh, people got stuck with a car on that little corner and we had to dig them out every time. <laughs> But uh, it was an interesting house. Uh, I just came there. Listen, I didn't know from who to toot. I didn't know what kind of house it was. Well, it was a rooming house, you know. She was renting out rooms. But downstairs, there was a basement. It's a very small basement area that had been used to store meat. It had a kind of walk-in closet with marble top that was for the meat. Well, I had to make up the beds every morning. So I came down to make up the bed, and somebody is in that closet and says, I can't take it anymore. I cannot take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and that is how it went in all sorts of, he was working at his, uh, at his uh, role in the play that he was doing, oh. but I didn't know that he was an, uh, an actor, <laughs> so I was worried about that he couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> well, we're going to take one more <laughs> uh, excerpt from uh, Fried's, um storytelling, and this is one that many of you have already heard, perhaps, and that is her story about Miss Everell de Jersey, who played piano for English dance in London at the time when Pat Shaw was giving his Another Look at Playford series. Or, or maybe you read the story in the introduction to Freet's last book, Serendipity. But this version recorded uh, during Country Dancers of Westchester's 2002 celebration of Pat Shaw's birthday really shows off the kindness, the good humor, and a comic's perfect timing that so marked Freet as a master raconteur. Uh, I was not able to find a picture of Mr. Jersey, so I included part of the instructions and the music from Pat Shaw's Dances, Volume 2, assembled by Marjorie Fennessy. About Mr. Jersey, she was uh People have heard, some people have heard this story about Mr. Jersey, but if you haven't heard it, it makes Mr. Jersey live, and I would like that for her. Uh, we did uh, a course with Pat Shaw in, uh, in such a shop house once a week uh, about play for dancing, and um, uh, Mr. Jersey was playing for us. She was, um, how can I say, she was a high-quality individual. <laughs> Uh, on the up and up, she was really a lady. She was ancient then, I thought, 
final clip may seem to emphasize the dragon part of Freet's legacy and, um, and and those of you who knew that side of her may revel in, in this uh, in this final story but actually I think uh, at a deeper level it does humanize her it is a rather long anecdote by Andrew Shaw recounting the time in 1997 when Freet asked him unexpectedly to share the calling at an evening dance at Halsey Manor. Now for whatever reasons uh, Andrew's dialogue is not always easy to follow even when he's in the same room as you are <laughs> but but listen closely and you'll catch the main gist of this story. That story is a tale of the dragon lady as seen by a friend and admirer and how immensely that friendship and the admiration Andrew had for Freet color his feelings about her, about her life, and her gift to him. Uh, and we became friends and uh, we corresponded regularly. And, um, I mean, for many years, I was the, I was the um, um, the main uh, promoter of her dances uh, in, in England and I did reviews of a couple of her books for English dance and songs and so forth um, and I can't remember the chronology now I don't know exactly when this was anymore my memory is dreadful as regards dates and names the only thing I seem to be able to remember these days is dances <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a bit <laughs> but at some stage, I mean, she came more than once, and at some stage, she she was booked to do um, a dance weekend at Halsey Manor, which I don't know whether you've heard of Halsey Manor, but it's um, it's a uh, it's a residential folk centre in in Somerset, in an absolutely idyllic position. Um, it's partly medieval building with later additions and it's just a wonderful place to stay. And she was doing this dance weekend. Uh, and I think it was the first weekend she, you know, whole weekend she'd done. She'd done workshops and dances all over the place, but this, this was a whole weekend. So all the great and the good in English country dance were um, <coughs> applied to go on, on, on this particular uh, course, uh, including uh, myself and Sally. Um, oh, somebody was, uh, Gene Morrow, I think, was, I don't know whether he just happened to be in England at the same time or what, but he was going to be at this weekend, and he was, um, he was going to share the evening dancing with Free, so that, you know, big voice and so forth, and didn't get too tired and all that. Anyway, two days before Sally and I had used to set off from Sunset, there's a phone call. Hello. Hi, Andrew, it's free. <laughs> Can you do some calling at the hall weekend in the evening? Oh, quite surprised at this, you know. Why? Um, well, yes, yes, I, I'd be delighted to free. Great. <laughs> So, so I thought, 
oh my goodness, <laughs> this is quite something. Because um, I knew you know, lots of people who were going to be there, and as I say, they were all the sort of the great and the good. I thought, I better, I better sort some, some of my favourite dances out, dances that I know, that I know I can teach well, you know, and so I started pulling a few cards out of my boxes. Next evening, this is the evening before we you to set off. Phone rings again. <laughs> Hello, Andrew, it's free. <laughs> I'm going to read you some titles out. Tell me whether you know the dances. So she started reading this list of about 30 dances. <laughs> and I was going, yes, no, yes, no, yes. So, she said, great. I said, don't pull the phone down! <laughs> <laughs> Why are you asking me? Well, turns out she's going to ask me to call some of these dances. So I'm not calling anything, you know, that I've prepared. I'm calling dances from her list. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> she goes. So, of course, I hadn't written anything down. You know, I just said yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> oh, right. I, then, I then sit by the phone with a piece of paper going, mm -hmm. <laughs> what did I say yes to, you know? <laughs> so, so anyway, we get there, we get, and the evening starts, and she, she starts calling some dances, and they're all dancing away, and then the, this terrible moment. <laughs> Right, Andrew! <laughs> Come call impertinence! <laughs> so, I, um, I mean, I knew that dance very well. I, I, I taught it several times, and I knew how she taught it. I could have practically taught it word for word the way she taught it, you know? So, it wasn't a problem in that respect. But of course, you know, she teaches in her way, and I'm teaching my way. And, I do things perhaps in a different order than she did, so... But I mean, I wasn't worried about this, so I got up on the platform, and well, I did get on the platform, and the platform's here, you know, it's, it's quite low, and she's... She's... Uh, she's quite low as well. She, uh, <laughs> and there's a chair behind her, and she sits down on the chair, you see. So I come up to the stage, and I'm sort of waiting for her to come off the stage. I can't make room for me, see. What are you doing? <laughs> said, well, are you, are you coming? No, I'm staying here. So she's there with her, a folder on her knee with the dancing that I'm going to call. <laughs> so I'm here. This is, a, this is about the size of it. I'm here and she's there. <laughs> I tell no lie, I stood in front of this microphone and I opened my mouth and nothing. <laughs> you would not believe that. <laughs> nothing would come out of my mouth and I tried three times to get a word. So, I start teaching this dance in Persian, right? And I say, I know the dance, I know how she teaches it, but I was teaching it my way, so I'm doing and get part way through this now. Andrew. <laughs> You're not teaching it right. <laughs> I said, I know what you're going to say, Free. I know I'm going to tell them in a minute. And I turn around to carry on. Tell them now. <laughs> But it was a it was a baptism of fire, and, and I'm sure she enjoyed every every minute. <laughs> and, um, I mean, we had a yeah, we had a quite sort of crunchy relationship. And I got my own back on her several times. <laughs> I mean, I remember one occasion in particular. I had um, written this review for English dance and song from one of her books. And I opened this review by referring to her as this posse woman from America. <laughs> so the next thing I hear on the grapevine is she knew somebody who made um, 
uh, leather badges, you know, with all leather. She had a badge made, bossy woman. <laughs> <laughs> she got, she then wore with pride. <laughs> well, the thing I got from free, I mean, it, it, it was not to do with, I mean, I love the way she taught dance technique and everything. But it was not that I got from her. I mean, I've been dancing for years and years, but I know that I was fairly competent. And I mean, you always learn something. You never stop learning in this game. But I mean, the main thing I got from Free was the conviction that I, I was looking for, really. I was looking for the conviction to actually be a teacher and not just a, a caller of dances. And she, she gave me that conviction. I mean, that was her importance to me. That was a big uh, influence, <coughs> influence on, on, on my life. And I mean, it, it changed my life in many respects because, you know, when you're a teacher, when you're, when you're demanding of people, um, they start to look at you in a different light. Before we end, I, I want to acknowledge that some of the photos in this presentation were by David Green and Paul Friedman. And the second photo of Halsey Manor was by someone named Martin Bodman, whom I do not know. I hope I haven't omitted crediting others whose material I have liberally stolen, but if so, you know, please identify yourselves in the after chat. In addition, in addition uh, Danny Walkowitz and Stephanie Smith deserve immeasurable credit for the video they took at the Freak for All at Lennox Mass and the interview they did with her in 1999. So we have not exhausted the story of Freak the Friendly Dragon, but we have reached the end of our time. Thank you everyone for your sympathetic interest and a huge thanks to Dorothy, Danny, Jeff, and the publicity team for the awesome support and the careful planning. Folks, I hope you'll stay for the after chat. And those of you who knew Freet personally and have a story to tell, please share it. The picture we have of her is made up of all the facets of her life, which those who knew her can make sparkle again for the rest of us. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, that's, there's a lot of spice there. There's a lot of substance and a lot of spice in that presentation to give a, a pretty rounded uh, view of, of who Freed was as a dancer and as, as a, per, a teacher of dance and as a person. Um, so uh, we have lots of listeners, lots of people who knew Freed, lots of people who did not on this call. Um, if you have questions, uh, I ask you that, to key them into the chat box now, and uh, we're going to uh, route them to Paul uh, one at a time, or, or collectively if, if the same or similar question has been asked. Um, while we're collecting uh, those questions on, on Zoom and on Facebook, I just want to remind you uh, our next Country Dance Lore event will be at the first Thursday of October. So, excuse me, November. So November 5th, uh, we are not meeting the week of October. We're just meeting on the first and third Thursdays. So um, at this point, I want to uh, reach out to Danny Walkowitz, who is monitoring our chat box on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, to begin routing some questions to Paul. Thank you, Dorothy. But uh, of course, thanks especially to Paul. Uh, Stephen Epstein has a question for you, though, Paul. Stephen, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? So you mentioned that um, her father was Jewish, which would have made her half Jewish. So how did she survive the war? Well, that's a great question. Um, in fact, her father was brought in uh, for questioning by uh, German agents. 
Uh, and the story that she tells was that there was something wrong in the paperwork. And I think his name was misspelled, maybe a middle initial or something. And so he grabbed the paper out of the hands of this man and said, this is not me. And he walked out of the room and, and nobody followed him. And then he ran all the way home and they hid him underneath the uh, floorboards of the kitchen. And he was there for a few days. Uh, and then he would go out and he would not wear uh, the star. He didn't put on the, the star. And uh, his family was quite worried about it. But and I learned this from uh, the interview that Danny did with her. Apparently he got a job in a milk factory and um, he was able to bring milk back to the family every night. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but but that's that's the story that she tells that he just was very lucky and that there was a problem with the paperwork and um, and nobody came after him. Well, the, the the New York dance community had an uneven relationship with Free from time to time, as I as I recall. But she of course played a major role, in particular in. Westchester, could you talk a little bit and tell us a little bit about the role she played in organizing uh, Westchester dancers and her relationship with Christine Held? I'm sorry, I, I missed that question, Danny. Can you talk a little bit about her role in Westchester, organizing Westchester and her relationship with Christine? Yeah, um, well, uh, as, um, as many people know, the uh, Christine and uh, Freet co-founded um, uh, the Country Dancers of Westchester in 1974. I think that they started in Pelham, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. But but they, you know, they rather quickly moved to the White Plains location. Um, Freet and Christine took very different approaches to the to the English country dance. Uh, Christine was. Um, focused on historical reconstruction and um, she led the Ch uh, Chelsea English Country Dance Dancers demo team of which some of the folks on this uh, chat um, were members and um, her her general uh, carriage in the dance was I guess far more restrained uh, than Freet's. Freet, Freet was a cut up on the on the dance floor. Uh, Freet also um, highly valued the historical dances, reconstructed many of them herself, and always tried to program a mix of historical and modern dances. But in her view, um, you know, dancing was, this dancing was for us, um, the modern people that we are. And um, and she didn't want to try to reconstruct aspects of the dance from the historical times. As she said in a couple of her essays, how would we even know what it was like? We should be dancing for us. So those were, that was sort of the main uh, division uh, that existed between them. There may be others here who could, who would like to add to that answer, but I think the thought, that's the general outline. Ara, do you want to add a little bit of your memory of the organization of the dance? Sure. Um, uh, Paul, I just wanted to say that the first location for CDW was in Flint Park in Larchmont. I actually danced there ah. uh, in about 1976. 76, 77. Um, and then it moved to Pelham, and then after that uh, to uh, White Plains. Yeah. Um, there, there's a dance in Freet's collection called Triad in L sharp major. Uh, I think um, Alchemy played that tune. Uh, in their concert of Freet dances uh, recently. 
And L sharp stands for Lee Sharp, who was one of the early presidents of the country dancers of Westchester. So her acknowledgement of her friendships through dance go back a long way. Free, of course, was very well known in particular for her choreography. Um, and I, I, several people I think would, would love you to address uh, when did she start doing choreography and what kind of role do you think, how important we all understand her choreography to be as an innovator? Um, well, she, in, in the interview that I did uh, with her and also in the memorial talk that her sister Noor did uh, at her memorial, at Freet's Memorial in Westchester in 2010, both Freet and Noor recall the time when Freet was really just a toddler and would dance in the bathroom. She would dance in the bathroom when she was having a bath. And when an adult would come in, she'd stop. But when Noor was there, she would dance for her sister. So her dancing goes back a long way. <laughs> as far as her choreography is concerned, um, she used to write dances, uh, she says, in the 50s, but she just threw them away. She, she never kept any of those. Um, the, the first dance that she wrote was The Wood Duck. And I think, I think that's 1976. I'd have to go back and, and check. Um, she may have written dances before that, but as, as she said, she, oh, um, yeah, she, she was writing dances, she said, um, and they were sort of contra-like. And um, she collected a group of people who were interested in learning the minuet. And this was probably in the early 70s. Um, and the, the teacher who was teaching uh, this class said, oh, I hear that you write some dances. Why don't we try some of them? And uh, I think that that was the sort of very early beginnings of the potter's porch. And um, yeah, she, um, she eventually did do a potter's porch. It wasn't originally at the potter's, it was at Dick Wexelblatt's apartment, which was this long uh, railroad type apartment in not very good for dancing. But eventually the Potters, Ed and Marjorie Potter, who live up in Connecticut, offered their porch. And we did indeed dance there. We danced her choreography. Um, if you look at, in the introduction of Serendipity, you will see a long list of figures uh, that Freet introduced to the English country dance. She expanded the language of the choreography, um, but in a way that um, respected the spirit of the historical dance that she had inherited. And I think that this was a very important um, aspect uh, in the development of English country dancing of modern English country dancing in our time, that she expanded the language and she gave people the freedom to think in that way so that others might do the same. You, you spoke um, of her self-consciousness about being a boss lady and making light of all that. Was she ever reflective? Did she ever have misgivings about her image as, the, as, a, as, a, as not always such a friendly dragon lady? Did this ever bother her? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's possible. I, I, I suppose I, she was, she was a very strong-willed person. I mean, you have to th think about this. She was in. Well, first of all, she survived the Second World War. That takes strength. She quit a job, and as a single woman, in the early '60s, she went to London to become a housekeeper. <laughs> She emigrated to the United States as a woman, in, you know, a young woman in her 30s. Um, she had a lot uh, of drive and will. And if she had doubts about that, 
I, I don't know. I will say, I will say, I can recall one time, I'm, I'm not going to be very specific about this because I don't want to implicate anyone, but I can recall one time when we were dancing and she turned to me and said, do you think I should tell this dancer something about their style? And, and she mentioned what she thought the deficit was in that person's dancing. And I said, I don't know, they're, they're a pretty confident dancer. But she decided that it was her responsibility to share that insight. And uh, this particular person was very angry, was very, very unhappy about it. And Free, you know, she, I think she, I think she felt that anger and she felt a little, a little guilt about it perhaps. But um, she tried, you know, she had tried. And I don't think she had done this in any sort of ber berating or critical way. She had, she had done it as a sort of friendly suggestion. I've seen her, uh, of course, many of us have seen her on the dance floor where she has um, been hard on her dancers. Um, it's, it's not by accident that she has that reputation. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not that, I like Freak and, I, and I, I think a lot like her about the dance, but I'm not inside her mind, so I don't, I don't really have a definitive answer for that. Maybe others do. Maybe others have seen aspects or spent time with her when she did reflect on that. And you're welcome to speak up. I think we'll, we'll have an opportunity uh, and to do that in a more a social manner in a moment. Meantime, I want to take this opportunity. Thank you, Paul, for sharing this well-crafted presentation about various aspects of Freed's life, rich with media and stories and, and with heart. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. <laughs> so in a moment, we're going to, to move on to just socializing. Um, but first, I want to uh, again note that uh, our next Country Dance Lore will be taking place on November 5th at 7.30 p.m., that's Thursday, November 5th. Our talk leader will be Tom Amasay, and he is leading a talk we're calling the Jack's Health News Hour. And basically, this is some historical things that were surrounding uh, dances created in the late 17th and early 18th century. So some historical stuff. Great, so things to, to look forward to. Okay, and now back to the present. Uh, we've all, thank you, Tom, once again. Thanks to my volunteers, our volunteers, CDNY's volunteers, Danny Walkowitz and Jeff Berry. Uh, it's wonderful having this. And now I'd just like to, to open us up to um, some conversation and uh, just enjoyment of each other's company. And I think, uh, I think here we stop the Facebook feed. Uh, while I am thinking of it, I will put this in the chat box as well. You may wish to save the chat and you may not know how to do so. If you wish to save the chat, you can do it from the chat box itself. At the bottom right, it says file and then to the right of that, there are three dots. If you click that three dots, there's the option to save chat. So if you wish to do that, it will save the chat at the very end of the call. So as you log out, it will save something into a folder labeled Zoom that is saved randomly on your computer. Okay, well, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, let the socializing begin. Thank you all for being here. Paul, it's a splendid irony that Abernathy House in, uh, in, on Frognal, off, just off Frognal, I, I lived on Frognal Lane, but the splendid irony of course is that Cecil Sharp lived just around the corner oh. last years of his life also in Hampstead. On church, on church Lane, which Frognal leads into. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I do have a um, a chronology of Fritz's life, so if there are questions about dates, I can offer some. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a question about when did um, when did uh, the street for all start? Well, it it ran for twenty years. 
And the last free-for-all was 2008. So it started in 1988. Paul, this is Paul Lipke. Um, Paul. Freak once told us that I don't write dances, I write poetry, but it comes out wrong. Yeah. Which I thought was a nice way to describe some of the sort of mannered and very structured way that she wrote dances. That it was sort of poetry that went astray. That's true. Yes, she actually wrote, uh, put that into, uh, I'm not sure which essay, but one of them. <laughs> Hi, Paul, uh, Tom Amasay here. Do you remember me? Uh, I just don't recognize you with your glasses on, Tom. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I'm trying to read the, uh, the, the lines on the next dance, but um, <laughs> I was unable to find the photo that I wanted to email to you, but there was a time when uh, Freed appeared with me on the stage that I would like to share with you. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, yeah. Wow. It was um, one of the uh, one of the weekends up at Circle Lodge, and she and I were um, asked to um, appear in one of the plays. I guess it was a mummer play. It was over 20 years ago. I don't really remember. But it was really, um, there's, a dance, there, there's a photo that I don't have that I really would like to send, but uh, it's her reaction to me being the leading man in the play that she and I <laughs> appeared in. So in any case, uh, I had that type of um, uh, experience with her at a true Brit 20 or so years ago, and it was... Um, I remember that, Tom. And then I remember mm -hmm. you, were teaching, um, you were teaching, and she was there, and it, it went pretty well, if I recall. I thought it went Even very well. you were trembling in your shoes. Yeah, I, I, I thought it went very well. We, we'd have to ask her about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for this. Yeah, thank you for that great photo. I think Deborah Dennett had a wonderful experience with Fred at Amherst. Hear me. I don't. I guess you oh, can hear Paul me. Paul Prestepino. Hi. Um, and I was just thinking back, and I and maybe Paul, maybe you remember the date or it, with the chronology and all that, but that Freet picked Hold the Mustard, a band which I've been a member of since 1980, along with Barbara Greenberg and. Daniel Beerbohm, and back then, Eric Scott, um, to record an entire album of her dances. Um, and I was working in a recording studio on 44th Street in New York, and we did the recording there. The title of, it got issued as a cassette only, which was a little strange, um, but the title of it was, uh, It's Easy, if you know where you're going, which I thought was a, a good title, especially for Fried's dances. <laughs> um, but it was an honor to, to do that recording. Um, we, we enjoyed it. I think it came out really nice. And I think Fried liked it too. And it was just, it was just a fun thing to do. Yeah, she, of course, loved working with you guys. And um, I, I think I have that cassette and the little booklet that came with it. Um, Sharon's shaking her head up and down. And she also has it, of course. The library out in the West Coast is the big one. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Uh, there were a large number of musicians that she worked with. Um, she gives thanks to them at the introductory uh, essay in um, Serendipity. Um, I actually have some letters from Fiona, and I forgot Fiona's last name, but uh, she worked with a, an accordion, accordion player in England named Fiona, and she, I don't know whether she did this with the folks at Hold the Mustard, but she carried on a very lively correspondence uh, with this particular musician. So she felt close to her musicians, and with good reason. <clears throat> So 
Paul uh, mentioned that I had met Preet. That's true. Um, I attended a workshop she was giving in Northampton, and I did. I didn't want to go. I was really intimidated and felt I didn't belong there. Um, but a couple of people that are here <laughs> were at Pinewoods with me and said, "No, really, you're going to be in Northampton." Ah, Bob and Ellie. They said you should go. You should go. So um, I was very intimidated, but after a while I had to relax or I'd have to leave. But when it was over, Paul went to get Freed's, uh, get the car to give her a ride. Because at this point she was, I think, already in a wheelchair. Um, and I was waiting for someone also. And we were, just Freed and I were standing around for I don't know, a long time, seemed like 10 minutes. And so she said, well, who are you? And where are you from? And I was like, you know, well, I'm from Kentucky. And she seemed just like, what's that? And she said, do you dance there? And I said, well, yes, we have many kinds of dance. And she said, no, 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 English. Do you dance English country dancing? And I said, yes, we do. We we have some there. And she said, how often do you dance? And it was um, twice a month. And she said, that's not enough. <laughs> and I said, oh, I agree. It isn't enough. She said, no, really, it's not enough. And I said, I'm not a dance leader. I'm just learning how to do this. She said, well, you need to dance at least once a week, maybe more, you need to move. <laughs> and now you are. <laughs> I didn't move. I just drive a lot. <laughs> well, if I could uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, for those who were wondering about how the Free For All started. Uh, Penelope Lord, who lives in Housatonic, or well, lived in Housatonic, Massachusetts, somewhat at a distance, sort of in the same area as Lennox. Uh, she was the one who originally organized it with Judy Grunberg. The two of them got freed to start the free for all. And Penelope really did it for a while and David Barnard did a lot of the uh, uh, registration work later, but it was really Judy Grunberg who for the first good number of years actually ran it. And you know, Freed would often it, there'd be a full list, you know, people who had registered. And then Freed would say, oh, have, has such and so-and-so registered? And the response, no, well, they haven't, re well, they have to come. So you will call them and get them to come. But we're full. They have to come. And so they did. The other thing is, he was, wasn't very sensitive to how people reacted to her on a personal level. When she was critical of people sometimes, it, it, she, was, she didn't realize it. And if you had, if it point, was pointed out to you, well, my wife of the time was disinvited to Potter's Porch for probably because I wasn't feeling very well at the time and I wasn't really dancing. Well, she sent a note disinviting us. Uh, she could have just not said anything and not told us about the next Potter's Porch, but she took the trouble to write a note. And when my wife 
talked to Leah Barkin about this. And Leah said, well, Fried would say, I didn't mean it that way, but it, so she, and it, Leah had seen that a number of times that Fried really didn't understand how people reacted to her. So I think she, get, she took the dragon lady moniker more as a joke than that people were sometimes put off by her. And I think some of the put offness also was a language issue because of her Dutch accent. And it took a while for people to, un to get familiar with that and comfortable with it. But other than that, she was a wonderful person. She was marvelous. She taught me how to dance. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Bob, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of stories like that, uh, but not with, um you know, the close um, uh, connection that your story uh, with her uh, has behind it. Um, and just to elaborate on what you said, I think it was not just her Dutch accent, but I, I also think it has something to do with Dutch affect and Dutch uh, mores and, and the way, um, the differences between the way Americans and the way Dutch deal with difficult issues. We, we like to smooth the rough edges and they like to, or at least in my experience, my, my very small experience with, with Friet, uh, they, they are very forthright in, in their opinions and, and say what's on their mind without... Paul, would, would it make sense for me to talk about my initiation into... Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you do that, Sharon? And, and okay. I think we'll elaborate a bit on what uh, David Millstone wrote in the chat. Yeah, but you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Sharon. Okay. Uh, I thought I had. I think I got muted again. Uh, this is a story that has been told probably too many times, but it goes back to when I came to Pinewoods as a total newbie had never done English country dancing, wound up at English Week. And it was Fried's first time teaching there. And about Tuesday of the week, as I was sort of staggering along from place to place, Fried is coming down, approaching me in the lane, and she suddenly veers over to me. And the first words she said to me were, you're going to have to work very hard because your feet are never on the phrase. And then she took off. And not knowing anybody and knowing, knowing nothing, I sort of went back to Grenicide, uh, kind of quivering. And Leah Barkin was in one of the rooms at Grenicide, as I was. And she saw me come in and said, Sharon, what's the matter? And I mumbled something about Freet and what she had said. And Leah said to me, well, you've got to understand, Freet is Dutch. She's, she's very blunt when she, when, when she talks to you about this, but it means that she likes you and she thinks she can help you and she wants to be your friend. And I sort of picked myself up and said that to myself. And a couple of years later, when I was in Holland with Fried at the Christmas course in Holland, a young woman who was the girlfriend of the guy teaching Scottish came up to me at the end of the first session and said, you know, when you dance the skip change of step, your foot goes like so. And I said to myself, she's Dutch. This means she likes me and she thinks she can help me, and she wants to be my friend. And it was true. Leo was right. It's a brilliant insight, Sharon. <laughs> well, it was Leo's. It had to be brilliant. <laughs> I, uh, I, I would uh, have discussions with Free. And we would maybe sometimes agree 
and sometimes often maybe disagree. And I would uh, agree to disagree and she would just disagree. And so, uh, but I did want to tell a story um, about a, a different side of, of free. Um, we were, I was in a, uh, a pine woods. She was doing a potter's porch uh, workshop for other, for, uh, for choreographers. And uh, it was uh, painful. It was, it was difficult because she was, um, rather than it really being a potter's porch, she was uh, and, and allowing uh, choreographers to do their thing. She was telling them what was wrong with everything that they were doing. And, uh, and it was very tense. And uh, the second to last day, I was sitting on the side, changing my shoes at the end. She sits down next to me and she says, Ted, I, I can't do this. I don't know why I'm, you know, I agreed to do this. And she was feeling the, the, the pain and the tension and she couldn't understand why it was happening. And um, I couldn't relieve her pain, but I felt it. Uh, and, uh, and she always meant well, this was my feeling about Freed. Well, thank you, Ted. I, I think that that helps answer one of the earlier questions in our, in our conversation. Yeah. Tom, you're muted. Okay, how's that? Paul, I know I spoke already, but I have an interesting moment that I shared with Freed, and it was in Lenox, Massachusetts, and it was the first time I attended the dance that she held there, the Freed for All, and it was a Saturday evening. It was between the afternoon and evening sessions. I had dinner with some folks and we were sitting around we were just finishing up dinner and someone said to me are you going to come to the after party and i said oh there's an after party okay uh well you're expected to bring something to the after party so they all went back to their local b and b's to get ready for the dance i went to the local grocery store i bought a six pack of beer I put it under my right arm and I'm walking back along that side road that leads to the main road. And I hear in my left ear, uh, Tom, I turn to my left and Freed's there. And it was later in her life. She had a cane and a purse and she was standing there and she said, will you escort me to the dance hall? And I said, of course I will. It would be my pleasure to do so. So I put my left arm out and she took it and she held her purse out and she said, take this. So I had the beer under my right arm and I had her on my left arm. So I put her purse on my thumb and it was hanging there and swinging back and forth and was slowly walking down the street. <laughs> and everyone else who had been in B&Bs behind us was going past us with their eyes averted to the situation. <laughs> and we got to the corner and we turned and there were other people that saw us there and Fried was on my arm and her purse was swinging from my right thumb and my beer was under my right arm. And we got to the location where the dance was and we got there and I walked her up to where the elevator was and she turned to me and said, already, that's enough. And she grabbed her purse, pressed the elevator button, got on, and she was gone. Wow. Tom, you had the money and the beer, and you went to a dance? Yeah, I got drunk after that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was great. It was, it was just a wonderful experience escorting her and watching all the folks go past us, averting their eyes, wondering... <laughs> 
what was going on? Why was Tom Amase escorting Free Tarman? <laughs> nice. It was great. It was really great. Well, um, are there others who'd like to share a story or ask a question? Hello. Uh, I always had a great time uh, at her dances, at the uh, special workshops, and every time uh, Nomad would happen, I would look forward to getting to do a contra dance with her. That was when her and Al were there, and she was always lots of fun in the contras. She would like to do silly things, and she was a very good partner. Yeah. Did you know that she wrote contras? Yep, yeah, she has quite a number of dances um, in the Contra or New England Contra style, as she put it in the uh, instructions. One of them was called Stars in Their Eyes and was written um, for the uh, wedding of um, George and Margarita Davis. And there are a bunch of others. And I guess Hailbop would so sort of be like a Contra. There, there, I think there's a swing in there, isn't there? Uh, there is a swing. Uh, it, it, it's not intended to be danced as a contra, but it's a fun dance. I, I taught it once at Lennox, and no matter what I said, people still danced it like a contra. <laughs> yeah, I always enjoyed being at the special events because everyone in the crowd would all of a sudden raise their their abilities, and it would be a much more amazing time. I felt that too. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to tell one uh, last story from my experience with Free, and that is the moment at which I felt that she had passed a, um, a torch to me for my teaching. Um, I was teaching Face the Music, and at, this was very late in the game for her. She, she wasn't going to be at the Westchester dance much longer. You know, she, she was in a wheelchair and was in the, uh, I don't know whether she was in hospice at the time, but I, I know that she had moved out of her house to, uh, to the atria, uh, um, assisted living quarters. And when I was teaching the swing, I, I showed how the extension of your arms allows you to control the speed of the swing. But if you pulled in close, the swing went faster. And if you extended the arms, everything slowed down just right for the right hand star. And as soon as I had done that, um, she motioned me over and she said to me, you're ready. I knew that, that, uh, that something had happened at that moment. So she had a way of um, letting folks know both the good and the bad. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm yeah. Grateful for I, your attention. Yeah. And let's, let's give Paul one more round of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And, thank uh, you. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Yeah, and I'm going to wrap us up for the evening. Uh, it's been just lovely, just just lovely seeing all of you and, and hearing all these familiar things that I care about. So. Very satisfying. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>